Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship you, to remember your greatness and all the things that you've done for us and through us and to us. I pray that you might help us as we need you. We need your spirit to give illumination to our minds and sensitivity to our hearts, that as we read your eternal word, that you might help us to understand it and learn lessons from it. We know it says that it's all there for our learning. And so, Lord, we want to learn. We want to be like good fertile soil that accepts the seed of your word. So help us, Lord, and, and help me this morning as I deliver that I might shine for you and help each one of us, Lord, to accept it and to not be forgetful hearers but effectual doers of what you teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. This week's message is the reluctant reunion. We've been looking at the book of Genesis, and we've been specifically looking at the life of Joseph. It takes up 25% of Genesis the old, in the Old Testament. And so as we go, we've been seeing how God has been grooming this young man from when he was 17 years old in his father's house, and how God has been growing him up and allowing him to be tested in all of these ways so that he might be equipped to do that which God has called him to do. We saw him go through obscurity, which nobody thought anything of his dreams. God spoke to him. He's had this revelation, and probably the only thing that I can find fault with is he thought to share it with a bunch of insensitive brothers. And as he did that, he wasn't respected, and he was thought of as nothing. In fact, they plotted to kill him. So you're talking about being disowned by your own family. But he gets picked up by Potiphar. He becomes the authority in his home. He basically has charge of everything. He can do whatever he likes with its time. And he provides a, a valuable service to this pagan person and does an excellent job. I hope each one of you guys in your secular employment do an excellent job for your employer. So they say, you know what? Everything you do just turns to gold. Why is that? And then you get an opportunity to share about Jesus Christ in your life. Do you have your hand up, young lady? Okay, because it looks like your hand's up. Okay. When my wife has her hand up, I wonder, is my fly adjusted? I just wonder. Sorry, I had a slight panic there for a moment. Um, so Joseph is being qualified. God is testing him all along the way. He's tested with obscurity. He's tested with authority, autonomy. He has full reign of the house, and then he's going to get tempted sexually by Potiphar's wife. Every single thing that he goes through, we see God allows him to be tested so that his character blossoms. And he goes into, he goes into prison, being falsely accused, not being believed what he said, all of these things happening to Joseph because God has something in store for him. Now, I wonder, if you have no troubles in your life, then maybe God doesn't have very high things for you to do. But if you go through difficulty, I wonder if it's because God has some great things for you to do. And he's qualifying you in your character. Makes me go, hmm. If I had a cleft in my chin, it would be more appropriate. But So last week, we looked at the family reunion where there was a famine. They come to Egypt for food because that's the only place there's food because God put Joseph in the right place at the right time to collect seven years of good. And he collected it. And they said, well, let's, let's go down from Canaan. We'll go to Egypt and we'll, we'll get some food. Dad says, why are you all standing around looking at each other? Get going. Sounds like a good dad thing to say, but don't take Benjamin. And we see Joseph has a replacement. Benjamin is now the favored child. And if you remember, he's the only other child he had through the wife he truly, truly loved. And the, the only one he really bargained for and, and worked for for seven years. And he says, just leave Benjamin with me. So there's this unnatural connection to the youngest one. Um, if you're a youngest one, I'm sorry, but that tends to happen. You, you may have realized that. Any of you the youngest? Okay, anything can happen, right? But he's favored by his father and he says, listen, I don't want him to go with you guys. And you wonder, why does he say that? Could it be that he has some understanding of what happened to Joseph? 
Could it be that there's a suspicion lurking in the back of his mind that the brothers may have had something to do with this? So don't take, don't take Benjamin. I can't trust you guys with Benjamin. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing to say to your kids, but he does. And so they go off and they come before Joseph and they don't know it's Joseph. And they are asking for food. And it's, it's a fulfillment of his dream almost because Benjamin isn't there, right? So he, they ask for food and he s- accuses them of being spies. Interesting way for him to react. Joseph could have reacted so many different ways. He could have been angry. He could have, he could have had them all killed. He could have done anything. But he chose to select them and call them spies. It's rather interesting. And they don't know who he is. You know, he's all shaven up. He's probably got eyeliner and the whole deal. He's an Egyptian as far as they're concerned. And they protest and say that they're honest men when they know they're not because they're carrying around the guilt of the loss of their brother. And I imagine they're looking over their shoulder as they're in Egypt, wondering if they're gonna run into him. You you ever go to your hometown and, well, you probably don't, but I do. I go to my hometown of Edison and I look over my shoulder and I wonder who I'm gonna run into Uh, because I didn't travel with a happy crowd. So I, I always wonder who's gonna pull up next to me and recognize me. But maybe like Joseph, they wouldn't know who in the world I was. So there's this three-day isolation in which they take one of the sons and put him in prison. And it's interesting who they select. It's actually the ringleader and the one who was probably in charge of throwing Joseph in that pit. And so he selects the one who led that mutiny and almost murder, and he puts him in jail for a while. It's funny how some time in the cooler will cool you off. And so he's there for three days and I imagine he's developing a compassion. And so he tells them, you can go back and they all begin to speak in Hebrew about what's happening. And they say, I just know it. It's because of Joseph. That's why all this hardship is happening to us. It's interesting. They realize that what's happening is because of Joseph, but they don't realize it's Joseph. (laughs) And so they they have this understanding that they've done something that they haven't repented of and they're reaping what they sowed and God is caught up with them. And as they have this conversation, Joseph is hearing them in Hebrew, although he himself not speaking Hebrew, speaking through an interpreter and speaking in Egyptian. So he's trying to keep it on the down low of who he is. And in the middle of all this, Joseph can't handle it and he excuses himself and he weeps in a closet someplace. And then he composes himself and he comes back. And it's one of six times that Joseph weeps. And so he says, what I want to do is uh, I want to put all their money back in their sacks as they take their sacks home full of food. I want to put all their money back in their sacks and bless them. And so he does that. And he does it secretly without their knowledge. And so halfway back, they open up the sacks and they go, oh no, my money is in the sack. And the next one, my money's in the sack. And they all check and all their money's been given back to them. Oh no, we're now thieves. We're in deep trouble. We're guilty of stealing now. I know this is, this is not going to go well. It's not like, yay, I won the lottery. I got my money back. They, they're like, uh oh, if Pharaoh finds out that we have this money, we're done. I mean, he'll cut off our heads and it will prove we're spies. So he says, you've got to go back and you've got to bring Benjamin. And so they're afraid. Fear strikes them and they're like, I don't know what's going on here, but this is really spooky and uh, deeply mystical. But God is behind all of it. Talked about how every human soul knows that they're a sinner. And they knew when they opened up the sack and saw the gold, most people would be excited about it, but they knew they didn't deserve it. And it's like everyone else. We all know that we're sinners. In fact, scripture is pretty clear about telling us in Romans chapter three, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is God's glory and maybe his expectation of us and we all fall short of it, amen? Amen. And suddenly Jacob, their father says to them, you have bereaved me, Joseph is no more, Simeon is no more. You see, he's counting him as dead. And now you wanna take Benjamin. All these things are against me. So we see he's got a real serious problem with depression. He he goes downhill really fast. 
And he blames the kids. And you wonder, why does he blame his kids? Could be that he knows something. Could be that he's curious, or maybe he has an understanding of what happened to Joseph. So this week, we're going to dive into chapter 43, which is the reluctant reunion. And they're going to bring Benjamin to go meet the wizard, I mean, uh, the pharaoh. I thought I would try teaching a little differently here today. What I'm going to give you is the, the summation of what we're about to study so that as we go through it, you might see it. So this is my summation slide. So as soon as we're done with this, I guess you can all go. But why does God test us? Now, it's interesting because Joseph is testing his brothers. Now, why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just announce himself? Why wouldn't they just have a happy reunion? Well, you see, because nothing's going to change in those boys. And Joseph knows that. He wants them to have a flavor and a taste of what's going on. And they have a completely different idea of Benjamin than they did of him, Joseph. So we see that there's change, but not sure that there's enough change for it to be permanent. So I think what Joseph is doing is testing his brothers. What's in your heart, guys? How have you changed over the last 20 years of being away from me? And so he tests them with these things, accusing them of being spies, knowing that they're not, getting the full rundown. Hey, you, you got another brother? Yeah, yeah, we got another brother. What about your father? Yeah, yeah, he's alive. He's doing well? He's doing well, okay. And Joseph begins to well up and has to turn himself away. So he wants to know what's going on at home. But he's testing them and he says, listen, I'm going to take your brother and hold on to him until you guys bring me this young man that you say is your brother. And when you bring him here, then I'll know you're telling the truth. And they're like, well, I don't think that's going to fly with dad. He's pretty possessive. Why is he testing them? It's interesting. Why does God test you? How many of you ever wondered that? A few of you. Well, you're, you're all theologically deeper than me. Why does God test us? Number one, to remove impurities and idols from our life, resulting in a greater trust in him. You're going to find this as we go through. God is going to test them to see if there are idols in their life and to remove them so that they might have a greater purity before the Lord. Number two, to free us from fear and shame in our lives and to reveal his grace. You see, that's what Joseph is up to. He's not trying to rub their faces in it like a dog that went on the rug. He's trying to have them have an appreciation for grace and remove the shame of the things that they've done. Because at, to this point, they have not confessed. They have not grappled with the thing that they've done. And the Lord always requires us to do that. And there's a benefit in it for us. It's not for him. He already knows. But for us to come to a place of remorsefulness of what we've done, confession, I agree with God, you were right, I was wrong, please forgive me and I won't do it again and you get to the place of repentance, it's all for our benefit. He already knows all of it. So to free us from fear and shame from our lives and reveal his grace, to draw us closer to one another as a family and have a deeper fellowship. Do you realize the struggles that you go through that you share with other people, that people pray for you, that suddenly that draws us together? I mean, when I, when I hear about things and I get, the, you know, the, the email about somebody's suffering or somebody's going through difficulty. And uh, recently this morning I was praying for Jules and his family and, and everything is happening there. And uh, all of the, I, I have to unburden my heart before I study here. I won't hear anything. And it was, just a, it was just really refreshing because when I saw him this morning, I was joyful. And I wouldn't have been as joyful if I didn't pray. It's one of those things that draws us together because we all go through things, don't we? We all have a various famine in our life that we have to go through. And suddenly, when we have to bind together and we seek the Lord on that and he answers prayers, boy, it draws us together as a body. So that's one of the benefits. We have deeper fellowship with one another. Because fellowship is so much more than just eating food out in that room. And to solidify our reliance on him so that he might display his love and power. You see, God doesn't want us to be lone rangers. You know, I, I got this. You know, it's the sheep that wanders from the fold that becomes a target. 
And I think the Lord wants us to realize that he wants us closer to him and he doesn't want us to wander off and he doesn't want us self-reliant because we fail ourselves all the time. Well, at least I do. You good people probably are pretty good, but I fail myself all the time. So it's to remove impurities and to purify us. It's to free us from fear and shame in our lives to reveal grace. It's to draw us closer to one another as a family and have deeper fellowship. And it's to solidify our reliance on him so that he might display his love and power. You know, if the disciples didn't have dirty feet, Jesus wouldn't have an opportunity to wash them. Now, it's not a good reason to step in, step in a doggy pile, but... I think it shows that God allows us to go through things so that we come to him. And that's, sometimes that's the purpose in it. And so that's basically the message for today. But I'll read through the fine details in the contract. In verse one, chapter 43, now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass that when they had eaten up all the grain that they had bought from, they brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back and buy us a little food. By the way, he's, he's asking them to take a six-week journey. It's not like, you know, go to McDonald's and pick me up some fries. But Judah spoke to him saying, the man, that's referring to Joseph, who he didn't know was Joseph, solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send if you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face until your brother is with you. So he reminds dad of, hey, um, I know you're hungry. And they're all standing there looking at each other, holding their bellies, listening to them, sing to them. Except if we go down, we're going to have to take Benjamin. Remember that, dad? And dad's trying to say, oh, just, just go ahead. Go pick me something up. Well, it's going to require you to sacrifice letting go of that boy. And he's pretty stinking attached at the hip with this kid. It's interesting how hunger is a really good motivator. You notice that? When I start getting hungry up here, I go faster. Because I know when I'm done, I can eat. Or when you're at work and you're like, oh man, lunch is an hour away. Oh, I better get something done. <laughs> Try to forget about the time. And it's, it's a terrible thing when you're hungry and you go into a store to go food shopping. It's better to be well fed before you go in. Then you make wise decisions instead of based on hunger. But hunger is one of those things that God uses to motivate us sometimes, right? In fact, the scripture says that a worker, his hunger drives him on. There's something about being hungry and having needs that makes you work and live up to your fullest potential. So I thank God for hunger. I thank God that I have bills to pay. Because when I didn't have any bills to pay, I didn't work. Because if you don't have to, why do it? And so the famine comes and they're hungry and he says, let's go get some food. This passion is promoting action. Because food is one of those motivators. At least I like good food. How about you? I like food too much. But it's interesting who rises up in the middle of all of this? It's Judah. Judah is the one who rises up and says, listen, this is what we got to do. This is how it's got to be done. And remember, you're going to have to let your son go. So Judah suddenly pops up out of the 10 children and is taking leadership because Simeon's not there. Simeon was probably the one leading to murder Joseph. But here's Here's Judah now rising up to take leadership now that his other brother's out of the way. And Israel said, why do you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? Like it was their fault. But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. In other words, we were just honest at giving an answer. Could we possibly have known what he would say? Bring your brother down. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. You see, Judah rises up again to take charge. Bring the lad down and I, I will take him. 
Send the lad with me and we will rise and go and we may live and not die. Both we and you and our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. Well, there's a whole lot of dialogue in there. Let me break it down for you. Judah rises up and says, listen, I'll take charge. I'll take responsibility. If anything happens to me, it's my fault. You remember what happened last time? I said, no, you're not taking him. Well, you know what? If, if anything happens, you can kill my kids. Do you remember that statement? If I did my job, you'll remember that statement. That's a little bit of an overreach, right? That's like swearing, to, I swear to God on my mother's grave and all that kind of bananas, which just means you're a liar usually and you have to assure people that way. Why does Jacob feel so personally wronged by this? You see, he doesn't have a heavenly view, does he? He has a very self-centered view. It's all about me and my comfort. And you know, we can be guilty of that, can't we? Where it's all about my convenience and my comfort. And he, he puts that way up there. When his sons went and murdered an entire village, he was like, why'd you do this to me? No thought of the lives that were killed. And he says, all the nations are going to hate me. It's not even about you. What, what in the world are you talking about? We can become extremely selfish and not take a godly view on things. And Jacob has this running thing where he's constantly falling in that hole. So Jacob feels personally wronged, like it's their fault. You know, it's the boy's fault. And Jacob then takes charge and he rises up. And I'm glad to see that. It's always good when somebody rises up in an event like this and takes charge. I think it's important that somebody does, right? He's telling his dad, listen, it's life or death. Either we're going to live and go or we're going to die staying here. That, that seems to me like he's making a plea with his father to be reasonable, right? Have you ever had to make this plea to somebody who was irrational and unreasonable and say, listen, what you're saying makes no sense. Right? Have you ever, you've never, you never do that? Wow, that's amazing. I have to do that at least, you know, at least this morning three times. He says, the reason we've got to do something is because there are other people involved. Our wives, our children, our lives are at stake and other people are too. You know, that's one of those great motivators too is other people, right? I mean, if I have to go to the gym and I plan on being there at 9 a.m., Eh, if I'm late, it doesn't matter. But if somebody's waiting for me, that's different, isn't it? That's like church starts at 10. Oh, I'm, I definitely got to be here. Or, eh, 10-ish, you know, it's good enough. Or 10.30-ish. Or 1045, you know, whatever. It's not that important. No, there are other people at stake, right? And when there are other people at stake, we tend to make things happen, Right? You are all incredibly quiet today. I'm going to have to rile you up somehow. And he said, I will take the blame. If anything happens to your beloved son, I will take the blame personally. That taking personal responsibility is not something that's a common occurrence in today's day and age, is it? Hey, I spilled my McDonald's coffee on my lap. You owe me a million dollars. Yeah, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Taking personal responsibility. Or the guy who broke into a home and fell down, broke his leg, sued the owner of the home. These things are happening. Or you have somebody who's politically connected and so, well, they don't have to go to prison. It's okay. Okay, so you're with me now. Good. And basically what he tells his dad is stop being an avoider. Stop putting this off. We have to deal with this. We've got to take care of this. You keep putting it off. If I would have left last time when we told you all this, I'd have been back already. It'd have been a done deal. So all he did was prolong the misery over the time it took the food to go away. And now they have to take an emergency run to go get food. It's important that you take care of things at an appropriate time. Because if you put them off, you'll miss that window. And surprisingly, there are side effects for that. You guys are still very 
quiet today. Verse 11. And their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man. A little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds, probably all of his favorite foods. Take double money in your hand and take care, take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise, go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Okay, if it happens, it happens. Okay, I'll do it. I, I just see the Yiddish coming out. I don't know why. I want you to take a little nosh with you. Take a little, take a little gift for the guy. Some food that he'll like. Some stuff that's from the local area. A little ganoush, you know, a little something. So Israel finally lets him go. Notice which name he's using at this point in time in the scriptures. Israel. Why? Because he's making a right choice. He's showing leadership. He's taking charge of his household and he's making things happen. The scripture calls him Israel, which means governed by God. Instead of Jacob, which means deceiver. I just find it interesting. Scriptures are exact because God wrote them. He used, he used human pens, but he was the one who wrote. So Israel finally lets him go. And boy, that is a hard thing when you've been holding on to something for so long and you finally let go. You guys know what that's like? You hold on to something and you're going to control it. You're going to make sure it's going to do what you want it to do. And finally you go, okay, Lord, it's yours. That's the way we should hold everything in our life with an open hand because he'll peel back your fingers one by one and he'll require it of you because it's an idol, right? If something is out of place, and unfortunately our hearts are idol factories, we tend to find all other things to take the place of God in our life. It can be any number of things. You can just fill in the blank. But it's good to see that uh, Israel's finally letting go and he's like, well, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. What are you gonna do? It just, every time I, uh, I read through that section, I, I read it like Mel Brooks is here. You know, Mel Brooks is, hey, guys, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. Whatever. <laughs> so the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand, and they rose and they went down to Egypt, which means they did what dad said. And they stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men will dine with me at noon. It's high noon. <laughs> then the man said, as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. So Joseph invites them to his home for lunch. And you got to wonder, oh no, he wants us in his home. He wants to kill us privately. But that's not Joseph's intention at all. It's interesting. It reminds me of Isaiah 55, 1. Ho or yo, depending on where you're from. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you, you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Do you know what that's talking about? It's talking about God's gift of salvation. Amen. And because Joseph is a picture of Christ here. Listen, we try to bring all of our good works and say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to, he's not interested in any of that. You're going to get it back in your sack because it doesn't matter because he wants to show grace. And so Joseph says, you're going to be at my house. We're going to have lunch. I remember when Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house. He saw that ridiculous little man up in the tree and he says, hey, you got to come down because I'm going to your house to eat and you should be there. So they're going to Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house because that's not something you do. 
And they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we were brought in so that we may make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys. <laughs> and then they drew, <laughs> then they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house and they talked to him at the door of the house and said, oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened that when we came to our encampment, and we opened our sacks that there, each man's money was in the mouth of the sack, our money in full weight. So we, we brought it back in our hand and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. In other words, they're defending themselves before they ever have a trial. But he said, peace be with you, calm down. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Did he lie? He didn't lie. He did have their money. And then he gave it back. He just didn't tell them that part. You know, it's like Christmas when you buy a gift and you don't have to tell people. Or a birthday. Do you guys like little secrets like that? You wicked people, you. So they're thinking he's going to call us thieves because we got all our money back and we, you know, we didn't want to keep it and we didn't know and uh, we brought the money plus we brought more money to buy. But he goes, calm down, take it easy, cool your jets. Your God, it's interesting that this ungodly Egyptian is now preaching to them. And they're having to be reproved by a godless person. Interesting. And so they're all frustrated and upset Proverbs 28.1 is a very telling passage. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no one pursues. It's interesting. Um, I'll, I'll go up to somebody and say hi, and they'll look me in the eyes, and I see their eyes get real big. And they go, oh, 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 I wasn't here Thursday at Bible study because... <laughs> Okay, no problem. I figured everything was all right because you're here now, so it's, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really sorry. What am I, a priest? Are you gonna confess to me next? What, you know, <laughs> forgive me, Pastor. <laughs> I wasn't at Bible study on Thursday. <laughs> Calm down. God, God is the God of everything and everywhere, and it doesn't matter where you go. God's there. So relax. But if you don't show up on Sunday, <laughs> I will find you. I feel like Liam Neeson, sorry. So they're afraid. They get called to lunch and they're scared to death that they're going to have lunch. Then he brought Simeon out to them. That had to be a fun reunion. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys feed and they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon. They heard that they would eat bread there. I, I hope Dave Loyley didn't hear that. <laughs> they were going to eat bread there. Oh no, there goes my whole diet. And then Joseph came home. And they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and they bowed down before him to the earth and he asked them about the well -being, their well-being and said, is your father well, the old man to whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, your servant, your father is in good health. He's still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. How often do they bow down? They're always bowing down to Joseph and they're just so, oh, thank you, you're not killing us, I'm so glad. You see, this humility would not have come had Joseph revealed himself immediately. So Simeon's released. Now remember, it's a six week trip for them to get home and then they waited for all of the food to go away until dad said, hey, go get us some food. Run out, grab me some uh, a Happy Meal. <laughs> it's another six weeks back. so. He's been in prison all this time. 
Dad just figured he's dead. He's dead to me, right? He said, I'm, I'm gonna, I've lost Simeon. You didn't lose Simeon. He's, he's just in jail. We got to get, you know, break him out. Can you imagine Simeon saying, oh, they should have been back by now. They should have been back by now. Man, should have been back by now. Just like Joseph sitting in prison and sitting in prison and sitting in prison. It's interesting when you walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, how you suddenly have compassion on what they've been through. <coughs> and I think that's why the Lord causes us to be tested in these ways. So Simeon is released. It appears as though he was the ringleader throwing him into the pit and wanting to murder him. So it's a very fit thing. Now, Joseph isn't punishing them. He's testing them. He is cultivating a heart of thankfulness in them if they receive it well. And then there's this unusual kindness of Joseph, but it's still concealed because he's speaking in the Egyptian tongue and he's not speaking in Hebrew and they still don't know who he is. I wonder if one or more of them looked at him and went, you know, he looks kind of familiar. He's got dad's chin. That's interesting. I wonder if they got suspicious and then he lifted his eyes and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? I love when, I love when God asks me questions he already knows the answer to. <clears throat> Joseph does this here. And he said to me, God be gracious to you, my son. It's interesting, he takes the name of God. And now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and he sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and he wept there. So he dismisses himself again because he can't control his emotions. And then he washed his face and he came out and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. And that's when Dave Loyley goes, oh, hey. he's, a, he's a heavy keto guy and he tells everyone the evils of bread. If you don't know him. And so they set him a place by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination for the Egyptians. So Joseph even keeps up this ruse with the separation of everything. He's trying not to cry. He's trying not to show his emotions. He's trying to follow this thing through. He's got a plan of what he's trying to do, and they see that Benjamin gets special favor even from Pharaoh's number one man, who's Joseph. It's like, can't you get recognized by your father? Can't you get recognized by anybody as being important and valuable? It's always got to be Benjamin. It's always about Benjamin. Benjamin's the center of the universe. That's the way they felt about Joseph, but they don't feel that way about Benjamin. They protect him. They show special care for him like his father does. They've changed. You see that? And so Joseph says, bread, let's have some bread. And they get the bread out and everybody eats. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to the birthright and the youngest according to his youth. He put place cards where everybody was going to sit according to their age. Do you know what the chances are of getting that randomly? One in 37 million. I must have raised their eyebrows. And the men looked and astonished at one another, for he took servings for them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and they were merry with him. He had all their place cards set up in order of age, exactly as they were. And he made sure that Benjamin's portion was five times bigger than theirs. You don't hear anything about them complaining. If it was Joseph, they would have complained. They would have wanted to kill him. But they don't complain. You know, it takes a big person to rejoice in the blessings of others without being envious. If one of you said, hey, Dave, come outside, look at my brand new Lamborghini. 
I'd be like, you have a brand new Lamborghini? I would, what a beautiful car. Look at the lines. This is fantastic. And in bright green, fantastic. Wow. How fast do you go when it says 60 miles an hour? 60, that's good. That's very good. It's such, such a useless thing, like an udder on a bull. Why would I want a car that goes 220 miles an hour? Anyway, because you can't do that in Jersey. Did you know that? Parkway, Parkway and turnpike drivers. Did you know that? He sits them and he gets five times more and they, they don't complain about it. They seem to be okay with it. It's almost like they're beginning to expect it now. That he's favored. But he's also favored by them. They're different. They're not the same. Learning to appreciate what other people have and the blessings God gives them is a sign of maturity. And so that's, that's my image of what it may have been for Benjamin. It's kind of like breakfast, lunch, and dinner all together on one plate. So why does God test us? To remove impurities and idols from our life like Benjamin was to his father to free us from fear and shame in our lives and reveal his grace, to draw us closer to one another as a family and have a deeper fellowship and to solidify our reliance on him so that he might display his love and his power. You see, Joseph is loading up to do just that, is to show his love and power. And I'm gonna do something I rarely do. I'm gonna go right into chapter 44. Here we go. <laughs> and he commanded the steward of the house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So they did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Interesting. Now he's going to put his cup it's a very special cup that he would use in ceremonies when he would come before God and pray and ask for wisdom. That's all we know. I wish I could give you the whole historical background, but that's all we know. It's not this kind of cup because that would be a little hard to hide. And those of you who know that's a Stanley cup, which isn't a cup at all. And it's been dropped many times. Verse three, as soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away and their donkeys, and they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off. Joseph said to his steward, get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which the Lord drinks and from which indeed he practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. And so he overtook them and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan, the money in which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever your servants it is found, let him die. And we also will be you will be my Lord's slaves. Oh, oh, ouch. You see, this is like saying tomorrow we'll do business and we'll go to such and such a place and make a profit. And you don't even know what tomorrow holds. Your life is but a vapor. It's here for a moment and then it's gone. It, you should not speak so boldly. Anything other than Lord will, it, you're speaking from an evil heart. Don't be so self-assured of your innocence. And that's what they say, right? We're innocent men. They proclaim their innocence and in solidarity even. They're all saying the same thing. Now they've covered up, uh, you know, the destruction of their brother already. So they know how to make sure all of their stories align. You know, like when you're going to go to court and you, hey man, we got to get our stories straight. They know how to do that. An unjust and extreme proclamation of retribution is attested. He says, listen, anybody that you find with this thing that you think we have, put them to death. Could you be that sure that every single one of your brothers is innocent? Oh, 
He would never do that. Well, you don't know that. It is often the mistake of the accused to overstate their innocence. So be humble because there might be another side of the story you just don't know. You guys know what that's like? You think you know the story and you go to execute judgment and you discover there's another side to it. I suspend judgment from now on until I hear the other side because I've had kids, two of them. One comes up, he did blah, 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 blah. Oh, wait till I get a hold of him. And then you go to him and he goes, yeah, but she did blah, 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 blah. And she did it first. And you go, oh, well, wait till I go find her. And now you don't know what to do. You got to get them together and you got to hear the whole story. Before you do anything, trust me. I punished the wrong kid once. And I'll never forget it. it broke my heart. Be careful that you don't make over attestations of such things, of innocence. And now, and he said, now also let it be according to your words. He whom it is found shall be my slave and you shall be blameless. And each man speedily, because they thought they were all innocent, let down their sack to the ground and each opened his sack. And so he searched. <coughs> he began with the oldest and left off with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. You've got to feel the weight of that. Dad said, don't take him with you because something's going to happen. And they said, Pfft. and they went without him. And then they came back and then they had to bring him. And dad had to let him go. And so they bring Benjamin and he's got all this favor all along. Looks like everything's great until they found the stolen cup in his sack. And the one brother just said with his mouth, whoever you find it with, kill them. Mm -hmm. Except they don't feel the same way about Benjamin like they did with Joseph. Although some of them wanted to kill Joseph. It's an interesting turn, isn't it? Is, is he torturing them? Some people think that Joseph is torturing his brothers. Some commentators do. Some very smart people got big degrees and stuff. They believe he, they're torturing him. Is this punishment? Or is he trying to purge the hate from their heart? As much as we suffer in this life, it is never as we truly deserve. Listen, whatever it is you get caught at, whatever you get punished for, whatever you get accused of, whether it's righteous or unrighteous, it's not half of what we deserve. Amen? Amen? If people only knew the things that you thought and about your past. My goodness, whatever it is we receive is way more than righteous. In Matthew 26, both in verse 39 and 42, there's two mentions of a cup. And I find that very interesting. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, they came apart from the disciples, he with the three, and then he went a little bit further and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he comes back and he finds them sleeping and he wakes them up and says, pay attention. And, and then he goes back to praying again in verse 42. He says again, a second time he went away and prayed saying, oh father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. Amen. This cup is representative of judgment in both cases. And Jesus is saying, if I got to drink this cup, then so be it. First he says, is there any other way? And then he says, if I have to drink it, then I'll drink it. Poor Benjamin is stuck with a cup that he didn't bargain on. And somebody said he needs to die. That sounds very familiar to me. Like Jesus in the garden. Amen. And then they tore their clothes. Each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. By the way, they didn't have to. They were off the hook. You remember they said, well, I'll be your slave. He goes, no, I'll just take the person who stole the cup. But they're not going home. They're not going home without Benjamin. Benjamin. And so Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. 
I don't know if you guys are keeping count, but they're doing that a lot. And Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? And you, <laughs> do you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? In other words, don't you know I got a connection? I know God. Don't you know that? I've got a relationship with God. You're going to try to pull this stuff with me. Don't you know that I know stuff? And then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? Who speaks? Judah, again, rises to the top. What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. What's he talking about? They're talking about Joseph. They're not talking about taking money. They're not talking about taking a cup. They're talking about Joseph. This is God's doing. He found us out. He has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. And he said, far be it from me that I should do so. This is Joseph being gracious. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. Oh, there's no peace. And there's no going home. And then Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. Do you see the deep shame that these brothers have been bearing for all of these years? It affects everything that they see, everything that goes on in their life. Shame is one of those things that degrades us in every area of our lives and produces in us a deep sense of unworthiness to receive the fullness of his love. You know, people, we hold on to things that Jesus died and forgave you for. Amen. Let it go. And shame will drag with you and it will affect everything you do. That's a stain that Jesus took out with his own blood on the cross. So let go. Shame is a very difficult thing to overcome, but the word of God is very good about telling us how we should think and what we should feel. In the situation, Judah is taking responsibility. He took responsibility with his father. He's taking responsibility before Joseph right now. It's a great and wonderful thing. We're going to see blessings that are put on him by his father in a little while. He gives a full confession of guilt. He says, God has found us out and found out our sin. They didn't take the cup. They didn't take their money back. What's he talking about? Joseph. He's giving a full confession in front of Joseph. And he says, no, I'm not going to make you all slaves. That would be very unrighteous of me. What I'm going to do is just take the one who had the cup, which is the one they can't afford. That dad said, please don't take him with you because I don't trust you. And I wonder why I didn't trust him. And Judah shows great respect and says, you are like Pharaoh. By the way, respect goes a long way. If you get pulled over by a cop, respect goes a long way. Disrespect, that goes a long way too, but in a different direction. Oh, stories. Respect is a good thing. So now Judah is going to present his case. I'm going to go through it quickly. Pay attention. My Lord asked his servant saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man and a child of his old age who was young. His brother is dead. It's interesting. He's saying this to the man who's supposedly dead. And he alone is left of his mother's children and his father loves him. Boy, that must've been good for Joseph to hear that he wasn't getting picked on as the replacement. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set eyes upon him and we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall, not see, my, you shall see my face no more. So it was that we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of the Lord, of my Lord. And the father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we can't go down. Our youngest brother's 
with us and then, then we'll go down, but we may not see the man's face unless the youngest brother is with us. Then the servant, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons and the one went out from me and said, surely he is torn to pieces. Interesting the way he describes that. He doesn't say he's dead. He says, surely he's been torn to pieces. So he knows he's making an assumption. And I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. In other words, it'll kill me. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us since his life is bound up with the lad's life like so much constipation, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. He's presenting his case. I can't go home without this kid. This is what happened. Now you got the background. I can't go home with this kid without him because my dad, he's old. And he's going to drop dead. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad. In other words, I put up my neck for it from, to my father saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. So he's putting a lot of pressure on Pharaoh to let him go, or Pharaoh's man to let him go. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father, if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. Do you hear the heart of this man? Take me. Don't keep him. He's too important to my dad. Take me. You know, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay his life down for his friend. Jesus said that. And it's exactly what Jesus did. It's interesting here in the Old Testament, you have before the law, you have the substitutionary sacrifice of an innocent for a guilty party. Isn't it interesting? And you thought that was only in the, in the New Testament, right? Or only in the law. It's a substitutionary atonement, which is where one person who is innocent takes the place of one who is guilty. The sacrifices that are all throughout the Old Testament say that very thing. You bring a lamb and it has to be sacrificed. And for every sin that you commit, there is a sacrifice that you have to make. And it's always something that didn't do anything wrong. It's not like you take, you take the really bad dog that's in your house and sacrifice him when you've done something bad. Well, that doesn't mean anything. It has to be an innocent, perfect animal in every way. It's the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ that it points to. And Judah, who happens to be the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, is doing that very thing and paving the way. You guys see that? It's incredible. The word of God is incredibly deep. Why does God test us? To remove impurities and idols from our life, resulting in a greater trust in him. To free us from fear and shame in our lives, and reveal his grace. To draw us closer to one another as a family and have a deeper fellowship. To solidify our reliance on him so that he might display his full love and power towards us who believe. You see, Joseph being a picture of Jesus Christ is doing that. And God allows you to go through trials and difficulties for all the same exact reasons. Amen? Amen? So, next week, it's going to be the final revelation of who Joseph is. Joseph is going to tell his brothers who he is. And we're going to watch their jaws hit the floor. <laughs> and I ask the worship team to come up and we'll do just one more song. I wonder if you understand why it is that God allows you to go through the things of whatever it is you're going through. There's a cleansing that happens of our own independence when God causes us to be dependent on him. 
there's a freedom that comes as we receive the grace of God through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And there's a power that we also receive by accepting that. And by dealing with the things in our past, by letting go of shame and those things that we have, we're gonna have a better relationship with God and a better relationship with one another. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart this morning about anything, don't forget it. These are precious times for me, and I hope they're precious times for you, where you get to look at yourself in the mirror in scripture and say, wow, God is letting me go through these difficult things for a purpose. And it is a wonderful discovery and a wonderful journey to discover what it is. But don't forget, because it is, it is our tendency to forget, right? This is a good time to consolidate those things before God and ask him to help you make a change.